Hello, I'm Nick McKenzie from Brown Jacobson. I lead our education team on corporate and governance matters. This short video is primarily aimed at governors, head teachers, and school business managers. It provides an overview of the conversion process and the key stages you'll need to complete. In many senses, the term academy conversion is a bit of a misnomer. This is because it's not possible to simply change the status of a maintained school to an academy. Really at the heart of the conversion process is the requirement to set up a new legal entity in the form of a company. This company is known as the Academy Trust. And it's this Academy Trust that enters into an agreement with the Secretary of State to run the school as an academy, a state-funded independent school. All the staff, assets and land are then transferred to the Academy Trust from the school and the local authority is appropriate. Therefore, the conversion process is largely a legal one. The Academies Act 2010 has streamlined the process of becoming an academy. It is now a light touch process with minimal support required. This really is in great contrast to the lengthy process that the first wave of academies had to follow prior to the coalition government introducing the, the Academies Act 2010. So under this new streamlined process, there are four key stages. This streamlined approach is really designed so that so far as possible, all issues that could delay a conversion being approved are checked before a school goes too far down the process. As a general rule, whenever you have a question about what happens when you convert, the DfE like to use a principle that you transfer as is and that you only get those advertised freedoms. Therefore, if you have a question as to what is likely to happen, you need to consider what currently happens. Now, because a key part of the Academy program is moving from a statutory basis for running a school to a contractual framework, this principle is not always easy to apply, and you'll therefore need expert guidance to assist you to understand the implications of adopting Academy status. In terms of timing, the DfE require a minimum three-month period between the date of the school's application and its conversion date. In our experience, whilst it's possible to do a conversion in three months, the average is probably closer to around five months. However, this really does depend on the individual school concerned, the capacity of your leadership team to take on additional work, and how much work you've been able to do before you start the process around stakeholder consultation and gathering information about your land. Conversions can only happen on the first of a month. However, currently you're not required to convert at the start of a term. In terms of timing, many schools often intuitively feel that a conversion at the start of term though is most appropriate. However, in practice, converting during term time may actually be more convenient. And I say this because lots of work needs to be carried out by the leadership team and the governing body in the six weeks leading up to the actual conversion date. And so if you do this at the start of a term, it means governors and the leadership team are having to spend time working throughout the holidays. So it really is worth thinking about the process as a whole when deciding your ideal conversion date. Now I'm going to outline each stage of the conversion process before we go on to discuss key elements in greater detail. Stage 1 is a very simple step and it's relatively painless to complete. All you need to do is complete an online registration form expressing interest in the Academy's programme. At this stage, you'll not be committing your school to convert to Academy status. You'll also be allocated a DfE advisor who will then get in contact with you to support and guide you through the conversion process. We then suggest at this stage that you gather as much information as possible about land, any grants that the school have had the benefit of, assets and license used by the school. I know whilst all of this may seem obvious, this is a stage which is often overlooked by schools. And I really would say that time spent gathering this information early on can really help you down the line. This is particularly true as the number of jobs that you're going to need to complete increases as the conversion progresses. And therefore, in our experience, locating information can be one of the key reasons why conversions may be delayed, as all parties are trying to spend time finding out who owns what piece of land rather than being able to address how you're going to deal with that. Phase 2 is a relatively simple process, but really does highlight the need to ensure that you've got all your ducks in a row before you apply. The DfE require each school to submit a short application form together with a resolution from their governing body agreeing to support the application to convert. Where any land 
used by the school is held by a separate trust or your diocese, then you're going to also need to get their agreement to continue to use the land as an academy before applying. Once the application is received, your DfE advisor will then work with you to resolve any queries they may have on your application. And then they will submit your application to what is known as an Ops Board. If your application is approved by the DfE's Ops Board, it is then sent to ministers who will make an Academy order. And once this Academy order is issued, this is when you can then access the Academy Support Grant funding. The DfE say that it will usually take about 10 working days from the date that you submit your form to draw down the funding to when you'll actually receive it. Stage 3 is the critical legal part of the process. Katie, in a short while, will go into greater detail on some of these key elements. All of these legal steps, save for stakeholder consultation, are supported by model documents issued by the DfE. Whilst it's true to say that the department are not keen on changes to these documents, it really is important that schools are well advised so that if there are any particular issues that affect your school, appropriate changes can be agreed with the DfE. On a number of occasions, it's been necessary for us on behalf of our clients to work with the department and its lawyers to find a mutually agreeable solution so that their conversion can proceed smoothly whilst ensuring the school's legitimate concerns are addressed appropriately. In summary, you're going to need to establish an academy trust transfer all staff, land and assets to that academy's trust and then enter into a funding agreement for the operation of the school as an academy in return for the DfE agreeing to fund you as a state funded independent school. Stage 4 is all about getting ready for your new life as an academy. It will be important to complete a number of registrations with a wide range of different bodies to ensure that the academy is ready to open from day one. One of the key elements you will need to consider is dealing with the transfer of software licences. As many of you may have already heard about the fees being charged in transferring the SIMS licence. So this is something that you'll really need to look at early on in the conversion process. Katie is now going to spend a few minutes exploring the key legal issues every school will need to consider when looking at converting to academy status. Hi, I'm Katie Mickelon, a solicitor in Brown Jacobson's education team. I'm now going to explain in more detail the legal aspects of academy conversion. Governing bodies must ensure that they've carried out an effective consultation with all stakeholders. There are no detailed rules as to the form of this consultation in the Academies Act or guidance from the DfE on this. Section 5 of the Academies Act simply requires that the school's governing body must consult with persons who they think are appropriate on the question of whether or not the school should be converted into an academy. This means that the school must rely on the general principles of public law as to what an effective consultation looks like. We are able to provide more detailed guidance on this, but as a minimum, we recommend that the consultation period lasts at least four to six weeks, that you make it clear to those you're consulting that you are consulting, and that you seek their views on whether the school should convert to academy status. You must ensure that you engage all appropriate stakeholders, for example, parents and guardians, feeder primaries if you're a secondary, members of the wider community and so forth. It is important that this is completed before the decision to convert is finally made. When considering the process of conversion, the final decision is usually taken when you agree to sign the funding agreement, not when you apply to the DfE to become an academy. Typically we would expect the governing body to make a decision as to whether or not to convert at a governing body meeting approximately four weeks before the planned conversion date. It's also important to remember that where you're a voluntary or foundation school with an existing foundation that holds land for use of the school, you need to have consulted with them, particularly because, as Nick explained earlier, you need to evidence their consent when applying to the DfE. One of the consequences of a public body, such as a school governing body, failing to consult properly is that it's always open for the aggrieved party to make an application for what is known as judicial review. A judicial review asks the court to quash the governing body's decision, in this case the decision to convert. It's therefore very important to ensure that a robust and thorough consultation process is not only carried out but also documented. The DfE will require an informal report on the consultation exercise before allowing completion of the funding agreement. It's also important to remember that as part of the governing body's proper decision making, 
they must consider a wider range of matters than simply the consultation responses. These include the financial impact of conversion on the school and the impact of the Equality Act. As with every conversion, it is necessary to set up an Academy Trust. This is a charitable company limited by guarantee. It is this entity that enters into the funding agreement with the Secretary of State. The Academy Trust has a written constitution, like a governing body of a school. This is known as the Articles of Association. The Articles set out the internal workings of the company's affairs. Many of the rules that apply to maintain schools also apply to academies and are set out in the Articles of Association. So, for example, governors have four-year terms, the chair cannot be an employee of the Academy Trust or the head teacher, and so on. The Articles also include what is known as an Objects Clause. This sets out what the Academy Trust has been set up to do, i.e. advance education. Because academies are companies, they are registered at Companies House, and the names, but not the addresses, of governors will be on that register. This register is available for public view at Companies House. Whilst governance arrangements in academies are similar to maintained schools, there are some key differences. The main difference is the additional layer of governance, which local authority maintained schools do not have. Academy trusts have members and governors. The members are individuals chosen by the governing body of the predecessor school. Members will, in effect, form the Academy Trust. Governing bodies of schools do not have members because they are statutory corporations and therefore the rules they must comply with are set out in statutory instruments. In the event that the limited company was to be wound up and had insufficient cash to pay its debts, then the liability of the members would be capped of £10. The role of a member is broadly analogous to that of a shareholder in a share company as members of an academy trust have a mainly hands-off role. However, they do have some important strategic powers, such as amending the Articles of Association, appointing what is known as Member Governors, removing governors, and winding up the Academy Trust. Like shareholders of British Gas or Marks and Spencers, the members are not responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the company. It is the governing body who retains the responsibility of acting as the critical friend of the head teacher and the leadership team to support them in the effective running of the school. However, unlike shareholders, members do not receive any profit for acting as members for the Academy Trust. We will now look at the governance arrangements for the Academy Trust. It is the governors who manage the Academy, although, as with maintained schools, they may delegate their powers as necessary to the head teacher to enable the Academy to be run effectively. Key governor responsibilities include ensuring a high quality of educational provision, challenging and monitoring the performance of the Academy and the leadership team, managing finances and setting terms and conditions for members of staff. Many of these responsibilities will look familiar as they are the same responsibilities that governing bodies of maintained schools have. However, there are new duties to reflect the legal status of academies as companies. As part of the conversion process, governors will need to become familiar with the new duties placed on them in their capacity as both charity trustees and company directors. It is also important that governors understand the obligations that are set out in the funding agreement. The funding agreement is the main agreement between the Academy Trust and the Secretary of State, which sets out how governors must run the Academy. We will discuss this in further detail later on. Our experience is that schools generally wish to retain their current governing body makeup or something broadly similar. This is usually possible as the DfE requirements for the governing body structure are minimal. The DfE require that the principal is a governor. In addition, the Academy's governing body must have a minimum of two parent governors. Finally, the members must have the power to appoint at least one governor, known as the member governor. Other categories of governor are optional, but there are some maximum thresholds. For example, there is no requirement to have a local authority governor on the governing body, but if this is desired, there can only be a maximum of one governor appointed by the LA. In addition, the number of academy employees on the governing body must not exceed one-third of the total number of governors, and the DfE only permit up to three co-opted governors. An academy can, however, have an unlimited number of partnership or community governors. We recommend that the governing body doesn't get too large, though, as this can affect the efficiency of decision-making and hinder the strategic role of academy governors, as envisaged by the DfE. I will now explain what happens to staff when you become an academy. 
Staffing issues can be a sensitive area for schools who are looking to convert. This is often due to the circulation of incorrect information about what happens to staff upon conversion. It is therefore important to communicate with staff early so that they have the right information and don't become unnecessarily worried or anxious. On conversion to academy status, staff will transfer from the existing employer, for example for a community school this will be the local authority, to the new employer, the Academy Trust. Staff should be consulted early on to ensure a smooth transfer of their employment to the Academy Trust. The transfer of current staff is actually automatic under legislation known as TUPI. In line with TUPI, all their existing terms and conditions transfer across to the Academy Trust. It's well publicised that academies do not have to follow the National Teachers Pay and Conditions Agreement. In relation to any new staff joining the academy after conversion, the academy would not therefore have to follow the National Pay and Conditions Agreement. For transferring staff, however, the National Pay and Conditions Agreement will form part of their current employment contract, and these terms will therefore remain a term of their contract after conversion. It is important to explore at an early stage whether or not a formal TUPI consultation is actually required. In our experience, for most academy conversions, only a TUPI process is necessary. This requires that all staff are provided with appropriate information and ensures they are kept up to date with the process. As part of the TUPI process, it's important to make sure that staff are given accurate information about their transfer, both immediately before and shortly after conversion to academy status. However, where the school is looking to make any changes to the terms and conditions, it's important to fully consult staff and unions on those changes. It's not just staff that will need to transfer. The Academy Trust will also need assets and contracts to run the Academy. The transfer and assets and contracts is dealt with in an agreement known as the Commercial Transfer Agreement. The local authority, the governing body of the maintained school and the Academy Trust will need to be party to this agreement. You'll need to compile a list of those contracts which need to be transferred to the Academy Trust, as these details will be included in the Commercial Transfer Agreement. In addition, you will need to consider whether there are any contracts or assets which should not be transferred to the Academy Trust, as they will also need to be explicitly excluded in the same agreement. As the local authority will be party to the Commercial Transfer Agreement, sufficient time needs to be given to enable the local authority to review this document and for any negotiations to take place before it can be finalised and signed. Although legally the commercial transfer agreement can be completed at any point up to the conversion date itself, the DfE are increasingly requesting that the commercial transfer agreement is in an agreed form some weeks in advance of the conversion date. When the school converts to become an academy, it will remain in its current premises. The property side of conversion can often be the most complex aspect of the legal process. The particular arrangements required will depend on the type of school. Also of relevance is whether the land occupied by the school is publicly funded land or private land. If your school is a community school, the local authority will currently own the school land and a lease for a term of 125 years will be granted from the local authority to the Academy Trust upon conversion. In the case of a foundation school, the freehold of the land should already be owned by the school's governing body. Therefore, the governing body will just need to transfer the land it currently owns to the Academy Trust. If your school is voluntary aided or has a foundation trust, a 125-year lease will be granted from the relevant foundation to the Academy Trust. Faith School's property is often owned by the diocese. In these circumstances, an additional agreement will be entered into between the Academy Trust, the Diocese and the Secretary of State. This is known as a Supplemental Agreement. The Model Supplemental Agreement aims to reflect the existing position regarding how the school can use the Diocese's land. For example, it reflects that the Academy Trust can use the land and building during school hours, but that the Diocese is free to hire out the school's facilities at other times. Further, it retains the position that the diocese can give two years' notice to the Academy Trust if it wanted the Academy Trust to stop using the land. If your school has received funding through the Building Schools for the Future programme and or is subject to PFI arrangements, this does not prevent conversion to Academy status. However, further legal agreements will need to be entered into to ensure such arrangements continue after conversion. This can mean that the conversion takes slightly longer than a standard conversion. 
As mentioned earlier, the funding agreement is the key contract between the Academy Trust and the Secretary of State. It sets out a number of conditions which the Academy Trust must comply with in order to receive its funding. It also sets out the types of grant that the Academy may receive and how and when such grants will be paid. However, the funding agreement itself does not detail how much funding the Academy will receive. This will be set out in the letter of funding. The funding agreement also deals with termination, how the agreement may be brought to an end. Either party, the Academy Trust or the Secretary of State, can terminate the funding agreement by providing seven years notice to the other party. The funding agreement also has a number of annexes attached to it. These also form part of the contract with the Secretary of State. Annex A is the Articles of Association, the Academy Trust constitutional document which we discussed earlier. Annex B deals with admission arrangements at the Academy. Annex C covers the Academy's obligations regarding pupils with special educational needs and the admission of pupils with statements of SEM. Finally, Annex D sets out requirements in relation to the exclusion of pupils. The effect of the annexes is essentially to apply the same law which binds maintained schools in relation to admissions, SEM and exclusions to academies. The final issue you'd like to discuss is pensions. As we discussed earlier, the Academy Trust will become the employer and therefore it will need to make sure that it's complying with all its obligations as an employer in respect of its employees' pension provision. And as you'll be aware, schools, there are two types of pension. There's a teacher's pension scheme for teachers and then there's a local government pension scheme for support staff. When considering conversion to academy status, the position is quite different for the two schemes, so we'll just look at them separately. If you take the teacher's pension scheme first, this is relatively straightforward and is unlikely to create an issue for governors and head teachers when converting to academy status. This is because the scheme, unlike the local government pension scheme, is not an asset-backed scheme, and therefore there is no difficulties or issues regarding a notional deficit transfer into the academy trust. Incidentally, there's also a really helpful guidance note being published by the Teachers' Pension Scheme for schools looking to convert to academy status, explaining what steps you need to take and how to register with them as an academy. But if I talk about the Local Government Pension Scheme in a little more detail, this can be a little more challenging for schools when looking to convert. And there's two particular aspects that governors and the leadership team will need to think about. The first is, and I've already mentioned it, this idea of this deficit. As you may be aware, many public sector pension schemes are in deficit and on conversion, this pensions deficit will transfer to the Academy Trust and sit on its balance sheet. And therefore, governors need to understand the implications of this and get comfortable with it. The second, perhaps more pressing uh, concern relates to the contribution rate for employers. So this means that for your school, if your employees have a higher than average pensionable service and benefits, then your individual school's contribution rate may actually be higher as an academy than it is as a maintained school. So it's really important that you explore this before you convert to academy status so that you can take any increased costs of financing the support staff's pensions into account when determining whether you're financially better off as an academy or not and the wider financial impact of academy status. Hopefully that has been a helpful overview of the, the conversion process. Now I'd like to leave you just with a few final points to remember. Really would suggest allowing four to five months as a minimum to sensibly complete the conversion process. It really is vitally important that throughout the process you keep constantly engaged with your stakeholders and not just end that communication once you've finished your official consultation exercise really is important to know your facts to be able to counter those myths that we all know are out there around the academy program and finally i would say it is a journey but the lawyers do go away at the end of the process and life as a school gets back to how it is now thank you for taking the time to watch this video you can download the training notes now you may also be interested in our short video presentation on how we can support your conversion process Full details of all our training offerings are available on our website, www.brownjacobson.com. There you'll also find details of our conversion service and how we can support your school's conversion to academy status. Please do not hesitate to get in touch with me if you have any queries or suggestions about future topics.